Good morning, everyone. Nice to see all of you here. So we have a really packed session. Let's get started. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Clicker seems to be not clicking very well. Okay. So why are we here? We are here because we partnered with Erred. Erred is the main distributor of electrical power here in Portugal, and they have um, quite a few challenges. They need to make sure that all 145,000 kilometers of low voltage power lines uh, are safe from trees. So our goal with this project is to detect when this might be about to happen and help Erred plan uh, the trees, to trim the trees a bit so that, this, that they don't pose a threat to the network. Now, let's see what we actually did. We created an application that you're about to see that georeferences the occurrences that the model has found, and it enables um, technicians from Erred to actually view what the model saw and have this video evidence working and see whether or not an occurrence is actually real. Now, this project started all the way back in 2019, and the original approach was just getting two small uh, low-end cell phones, stick them in the window of the car, and as we drive by, create a 3D map of all the surrounding uh, vegetation and the grid lines. Turns out that's not possible to do because you get mostly a blurry image and nothing else at the usual speeds of the car. But we did do a suggestion, which is what end up in what you're about to see. And this suggestion is, let's take the video in the front of the car and then perform, use a neural network model to capture the places where the trees and the grid line are close so that um, we can detect occurrences. Now, we did this in 2019. We published a paper on it in 2021 in the CIRET conference. And by 2022, Erich and we were talking again because the world had shifted. Of course, four years in AI is a very long time. Now there are much better models. And we could do this project and take it a step further. So this is our main talking point uh, for today. We wish to share with you the, the lessons we learned and how you can apply these same principles to your own uh, projects. Now, it's not just about uh, deep learning and um, computer vision specialists. We, of course, need a whole team of cloud and data engineers, domain knowledge experts, and application experts to create a viable product that is actually useful. This is a computer vision project, so we need to focus on what we see. And we need to distinguish between those images that we capture in the car that are perfectly safe, there's no problem there, and from the ones that actually give us some sort of risk we distinguish between two types of risk. Type one, where the grid line is supported by those big supports, and those uh, supports are actually very close to a tree. This poses one kind of risk. And the second kind of risk is the type two risk, where the supports are nowhere near the trees, but the trees still pose a risk because they might touch or otherwise harm the grid cables themselves. Now, we went with YOLO. YOLO, as I'm sure most of you know, is an object detection network. And what this means is that the output of the model are bounding boxes. So it tells you the location of the objects in the image. We look for different kinds of objects. Supports for power lines, but also supports for telecommunication lines. Because here in Portugal, we have both near the roadside. And sometimes they're very similar, and sometimes they're on the same side of the road, and they're just interspersed, they're just mingled. However, sometimes they're not. And we do want to distinguish the occurrences where they affect the power grid, and so they are interesting for us, 
and the ones that are for telecommunications, which are not relevant. Now, object detection is not actually enough. We also need heuristics. And heuristics are simply rules that we use to get the detections, and from those detections, build knowledge, build understanding, to figure out whether or not those specific detections uh, perform a risk. For example, if you have a very high support and a very small tree, like a bush, it poses absolutely no threat. You can discard that. That's not a problem. However, if you have a big tree and it's close to the support, then you might have a problem. Also, sometimes the bounding boxes are quite far, as in the right-hand side, um, where you can see that the region of interest, which is the place where the wires are located, is what really matters and not the distance uh, to the poles. Now, some of you might be asking, can we detect the wires? Well, kind of. We can detect the wires sometimes, but not reliably, especially when it's raining or it's foggy or when it's uh, rather dark and the car is moving quickly. So we can't really rely on detecting the cables. So we have to figure out where the supports are and then build the region of interest from the location of the supports. But heuristics are still not enough. We also need tracking. And the reason for that is because as we drive, the perspective shifts. You could see that that support seemed to be close to the tree, but as you advance, you notice that it's not. And this means updating the beliefs about the world, where we have occurrences or not, based on not just one observation, but a sequence of observations. Given that set of detections, what is the likelihood of a detection? For example, if you have a whole, um, let's imagine type one risk. For type one risk, the support and the tree are just close by. If you follow them and they start tracking and suddenly they're quite apart, then it's definitely not an occurrence. So it's quite easy to spot that you can't have an occurrence of a type one risk if you have the bounding boxes quite apart. So now you have a really high level overview of the project and what we did. Now we want to share with you the key insights of what uh, we've learned uh, around uh, doing these several iterations of this project. And the first key thing is to always learn from your mistakes. So consider what's not working and then do it better. Now we will get into some of these things in the later slides. For now, I just want to talk with you a little bit about the model. One of the things that we did originally was try and spend a lot of time training models to see what is the best learning rate, what are the best hyperparameters for the model. Turns out that it really mostly doesn't matter. As long as you're in the ballpark, you're in the correct place, if you train the same model with the exact same parameters, you will get different orders of the training data because everything is randomized, the batches are randomized, and that means that your models will perform differently. And it turns out there's a huge variance using the exact same parameters. So if you're just trying out different hyperparameters and comparing them directly, you're basically learning nothing but noise. So that's just something to keep in mind. If you are going to fine tune a model and train it, do it several times over. Now, this is by far the most important thing. Our labels need to be consistent. If the labels are not consistent, you are not teaching the model one thing, and you're really confusing the model. Now, for us, one of the largest challenges are the tree clumps. So you can see there's a large square on the right-hand side. And this large square, how many trees are there? Now you have a pole. I'm not sure if you can use it or not, uh, but um, just quickly for a show of hands, how many of you see at least two trees in that big square? Okay, three, four trees. Okay, perfect. So we have one person who spotted five trees. Okay, so there are quite a lot of tr different trees. And the problem is that different people in the room saw different amounts of 
trees. And this happens to our labels as well. When you have different um, labels, the model really struggles. So we need to find a way to have these things be very, very um, consistent. And that implies getting our people talking to each other. Good, next. Another key thing for us, contextual evaluation. This is partitioning your data set into different challenges for the model. If you have very low light conditions, then the colors are mostly missing, and you have basically a contrast image, like you can see on uh, the right-hand side, top and middle. You can also have forest, where there's, it's usually very misty, and um, there's a lot of moss, so the usual texture of the supports is quite different. Besides, there's a lot of tree overlap. Then you have images where it's sunny, so the model has very, very different challenges. And if we only have one number for all of these challenges, we don't really know what kind of labeling data the model needs. So if you partition your data set, and we can get into the details of how to do that, if you do that, what you are able to do is you are able to select the data that the model needs to learn. Meaning you can focus your labeling effort where the model will be, um, where it needs it the most. You can also focus your labeling efforts in the scenarios that are most common so that your model will perform the best possible in all the usual real world scenarios. Finally, Recurrent pre-labeling. Why is this important? So, first of all, what is this? This is about training your models often. Meaning, do some labeling, fine-tune your model, and then use that model to create the, labelers, the labels for your data labelers. Wait, why? Well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the people doing data labeling in our teams are data scientists. They actually understand the impact of the labels they are creating. And if they have the feedback from the model, they can see what works and what doesn't. Second, and even more important, data scientists' time is precious. So therefore, as much as we can help them do the labels more effectively, the better it is because we'll have more labels. Even more important, all the labels that are already good enough, that already follow the rules that we've applied and uh, decided upon, those rules about the consistency of the images, then the data labelers don't need to touch the labels at all. And this means that your model has already learned something that is good enough, it's consistent, and now it's already applying that knowledge for the labeling meaning that your labeling will become consistent. And this is really, really huge. So you have higher quality labels faster, and you gain one last insight as well, which is your risk, the risk of your project will diminish because your data labelers will be able to tell you the model works very well in hazy time, or, but it cha it's challenged when it's raining, or it has some challenges when it's too dark, or the sun is in the front and so on. So they will know exactly what kinds of things work, what kinds of trees work, and different things. Now, we wanted to tell you just a little bit about our results and just some key highlights. As we begin this process, the model is not very good, it's not very consistent, and so the progress is slow. And as the progress is slow, and we're seeing that, okay, we might need even more data than what we were expecting, so we get some more labelers on board. Turns out these labelers are not are new to the problem. They're not doing as good labels as we were hoping. They're not as consistent as the others, so the model actually decreases. It doesn't improve, at least not initially. It gets worse. Why? because the labels were not consistent. Now, we realized this was a problem, so we started uh, getting some of our people, the best that were labeling for the longest time, and we get them not doing new labels, but actually reviewing the labels um, that were already uh, set by the other data labelers. And this caused a huge performance improvement. You can see over 20 percentage points. 
Now, this is F1 score, so this is really, really huge for an object detection model. Um, our feedback from our data scientists was, was that um, by the end of this systematic review, the model was so good, they were mostly not doing anything. So the, the labels were mostly pretty good. So we decided to try something. What if we label uh, a lot of stuff just from the model, no one touches it, and we train a model and see what happens? And what happens is the light blue, the performance gets worse. So it turns out that even though we don't tweak a lot, we tweak just enough to really make a difference. And that's the final slide that you will see. Sorry, the final um, bar, uh, which is what happened when we started reviewing those labels and the, the performance got back up. Now, we talked about contextual evaluation. So here's uh, an example of that for the last model that we saw. And on, so this is a bit, um, a lot of information. There are a number of small bars. Those small bars are from our initial 2019 model. You can see it was not uh, very good. And the top bars are the bars from our current model. Now, of course, back in 2019, we were using a different model. There were all sorts of changes uh, that, we made, that we made aside from just the models. Uh, but these results do not include heuristics. So this is, this is just comparing one model to the other model. Now, a couple of interesting uh, points to take away, take home. You can focus on the most frequent scenario. That's the scenario where your model performance will, will have the highest leverage for you. If you do that, it will obviously improve. Another thing that I would uh, like to call your attention to is your evaluation metric might actually not be entirely correct. Let me explain. In the, in the three scenarios, the ones that say more tree clumps, those are the scenarios where we had a lot of trees. And that means a lot of trees were close together. And sometimes the suggestion from the model, the model found two trees or one tree clump or two tree clumps, but our labelers labeled it differently. And this means that when we are evaluating the model, it will fail. It will fail to detect the, what the labelers detected, and it will detect things that the labelers did not detect. Both of these things count against the model. And that's why we have, even though we have <laughs> quite awesome results for object detection, um, we can't really always trust this metric because the metric is actually not as good. Now, we could, of course, go hand by hand and look at every single uh, prediction from the validation set and the test set, this would take a long time and it's not really the focus. So these numbers are quite good enough. And with that, I think we're about running uh, out of time. So I would just uh, like to summarize um, the NTT data engine approach. So these three key pillars, the three main takeaways we want you guys to take home and apply in your projects. First, effective labeling. This means consistent labeling, focusing on rules, and getting your data labeling teams talking a lot, making sure everyone is on board, making sure everyone is following the same rules, and that their output is consistent. Contextual evaluation. Remember, we need to partition the data set in, in ways that the model will find uh, challenging in different ways we challenge the model. This is important because it allows us to focus our data labeling efforts where it pays the most. And finally, recurrent pre-labeling. As often as you can, train a model, use it to pre-label. This will make for more consistent labels, higher quality labels, more labels faster, so just do it. And with that, Thank you very much, and I hope you have a lot of questions, and that's it. Please. <clears throat> yeah, we do have a lot of questions. Awesome, thanks. <laughs> so, uh, first one, the most voted one, how often do you need to update the data? For example, trees grow, uh, do you adjust the model? Um, and another thing, there is a difference between risks in winter and spring. How do you deal with that? Okay, so that's an awesome question. Thank you very much. So it turns out that 
the way we are collecting this is because um, Erich has this um, team of people going all around those 145,000 kilometers and checking on the trees every uh, now and then. The object of this is to, whenever a hedge goes on a maintenance, for any reason, they'll just record the video of the trip, and that data will get processed. So they would get feedback a lot sooner. So we wouldn't really need to worry about the tree growing up, because they would be passing these uh, different places very often. <coughs> OK. And how do you track the trees through the different frames? Because there's oh, one okay. thing. That now that, that's an awesome question. That is, that is really <laughs> challenging. OK, so it turns out that perspective, things change very little when they are very far away, and they change a lot when they're close by. So there's quite a lot to unpack here. Um, I'm not going to go totally give you a full answer because it would take a long time, but please feel free to drop by our kiosk and uh, we can chat at length about it because it will take a bit. But overview, what we do is we start with the closest ones, the ones that move the least and use those as the ones we're sure. And then we try and figure out the, the, the bigger bounding boxes later after the ones we are the most sure about. There's also a, another trick, which is we use the kind of detection has a, an extra dimension, meaning that when it's very far away, it's very easy, even for us human laborers, to confuse um, telecommunication supports with power line supports. And um, what we do is we weigh it less if it's very far away, and we weigh it more if it's closer and we can tell the difference uh, more often. Um, there's someone asking as well if do you if you optimize your data mm -hmm. uh, collection as well. For example, uh, uh, if you do more collection in critical areas where the labels change a lot and are really hard to 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 figure out what's happening there. If you collect more data, more visual data there. Okay, so that brings us to our contextual evaluation. We actually know where exactly the model struggles the most and where we can focus our data collection efforts. Okay. okay, so we have plenty of data because it is quite easy to do a two hour drive, but it's not so easy to do a two hour labeling yeah. session for all of those images. Uh, one last question, I think, um, that is, how did you solve the labeling issue with the number of threes? Uh, ah, okay, so that takes a while. We actually have one of our uh, labelers that was responsible for label consistency, Caio, over there, so please feel free to drop by the kiosk. He will, happy, he will be very happy to tell you all of our um, war stories from <laughs> labeling. Um, but we can tell you that it's mostly to do with trying to identify if, can you spot clearly, can you do the labels as you're supposed to do? Can you really identify where the tree starts and stops and do it consistently? Then yes, do it. If not, just make a big clump. Now, that's okay. not foolproof, and uh, it's a bit subjective. Yes, that's why the performance is not as good. Or, I mean, the performance is quite as good, but the numbers are not quite as good due to that yeah. discrepancy.